The other day I was looking through my bookshelf and happened to find the first book I ever read on economics, Economics for Dummies. I felt nostalgic for a time before I had a YouTube account and was the target of every right-wing nut job on it. I had to flip through for old times' sake and thought I'd reread some passages that actually began my journey into the subject. The book was as much as I remembered most economics explained in plain English. A while into my trip down memory lane, I came across a section where the author, Shin Masaki Flynn, began to speak about Karl Marx. It was in this particular passage where he claims he was going to explain his ideas before discrediting them. Well, that's a hell of a claim. Being a Marxist-Leninist Maoist, there was no way I was going to give up going over his bragging of being able to discredit the most radical and challenging economists of all time. Now, I was quite enthused to find out what kind of critique he was going to make. Dr. Flynn is not a libertarian, so I expected a much better argument from him. Libertarians have been rather dishonest in the economic debate since the global collapse of capitalism in 2008. Well, actually, they've always been. I was disappointed to find out that his criticisms were really vague and not very well backed up, if at all. As a result, I'm dedicating this post to crit critiquing the section of Economics for Dummies on Karl Marx, refuting Dr. Flynn's claims. For brevity's sake, I will not be posting his entire section on Marx. I will only be posting the parts where I think he is explaining why Marx is supposedly wrong. In particular, he believed that the only the capitalists who would survive and whose business would grow were those who paid workers the minimum salaries necessary for the workers to survive. Thus, even as productivity and output rose rapidly, workers would endure permanent grinding poverty out of which they'd never be able to rise except by means of violent overthrow of the capitalists, an overthrow in which the workers would gain control over the factories. Marx argued that this violent overthrow would be facilitated by what he saw as an inevitable tendency towards concentration and monopoly. When, one, when only one monopoly firm in each industry existed, the workers would find it much easier to revolt and take over the system. With a century and a quarter of hindsight, we know that Marx was wrong in his economic thinking, particularly workers' wages do rise over time. In fact, they rise on average as fast as technological innovation increases productivity levels. That's because capitalists compete over the limited supply of workers, and wages get bid up as quickly as productivity improvements allow one capitalist to bid higher wages to steal workers away from other capitalists. In addition, competition does not lead to each industry being dominated by a single monopoly firm, and even if this were inevitably true, governments would still have a strong interest in preventing that outcome. Instead, competition remains robust in most industries, and consequently delivers all the benefits of Adam Smith's invisible hand. What I think he's referring to here, I'm not sure it's not specific, is the subject of capitalist concentration of capital. Well, that did happen. It's basically impossible to deny it. Of course, not a single capitalist entity controls an entire sector of production, but there has been a massive reduction in the availability of firms that actually produce. The entire world economy is now dominated by no more than 200 giant companies, the great majority of which are based in the USA. Right now, there is basically a handful of automobile manufacturers in the world. At one time, there were almost 200 in France alone. A concentration of competition has definitely happened. In addition, Chinese firms produce most of the cheap commodities that are available in the world. As a result of this, there's been a massive deindustrialization of the West, the United States, and Canada particularly. I would also add that the emergence of Walmart is sure proof that monopolies exist. In fact, the totality of their control is overwhelming. There are now optometrist offices, grocery stores, and even doctor's offices in them as well. They have put untold millions of small local producers out of business as they have taken over entire markets. This one cannot deny. The process of monopolization has reached unprecedented proportions. In the first quarter of 2006, mergers and acquisitions in the USA amounted to $10 billion a day. This feverish activity does not signify a real development of the productive forces, but the opposite. And the pace of monopolization does not diminish, but increases. On November 19 to 20, 2006, the value of mergers and acquisitions in the USA amounted to a record of $75 billion in just 24 hours. Takeovers are a kind of corporate cannibalism that is inevitably followed by an asset stripping, factory closures, and sackings. That is, by the wholesale and wanton destruction of the means of production and the sacrifice of thousands of jobs on the altar of profit. It is just that we in the first world have not yet reached this point. 
as we can see, the situation is actually getting worse as the entire world is falling into recession. Real wages have diminished since the 1970s, and the gap between what workers are producing and what they receive increased exponentially. So wages are lowering in terms of what they are producing as opposed to what they receive. Another major contributing factor is the shifting of this burden to the third world, where many commodities the working class uses are produced under greater levels of exploitation. These have made those commodities cheaper for the working class in the first world, making their living standards more affordable. What really happened here was that a portion of the poverty was transferred to the third world to offset some of the social instability, violent overthrow of the capitalists, that arises as a result. In truth, we can see these violent attempts by the working class to relieve themselves in these conditions, grinding poverty. It is in these areas affected that the return of Marxists, primarily Maoist revolutionary movements, have returned. The Philippines, China, Peru, Colombia, which is just Marxist-Leninist, and others. The classes didn't polarize exactly as Marx had predicted, but they have certainly done so. Based on the data that Marx had at the time, he couldn't know the capital would be shifted to the third world. One merely has to look at the events of Occupy Wall Street to see what could be the beginnings of such upheaval in the first world. One could merely look at the situation in Greece in addition. Dr. Flynn also completely makes a straw man of Marx's argument of the lowering of wages. At no point did Marx say that wages would be lowered and then never rise for any reason, nor did he say that they would always stay at a minimum wage. This is completely untrue. So, in future, the German Workers' Party has got to believe in LaSalle's Iron Law of Wages. That this may not be lost, the nonsense is perpetuated of speaking of the abolition of the wage system. It should read, System of Wage Labor together with the iron law of wages. If I abolish wage labor, then naturally I abolish its laws also, whether they are of iron or sponge. But LaSalle's attack on wage labor turns almost solely on this so-called law, in order, therefore, to prove that LaSalle's sect has conquered, the wage system must be abolished together with the iron law of wages and without it. Since LaSalle's death, there has asserted itself in our party the scientific understanding that wages are not what they appear to be, namely the value or price of labor, but only a masked form for the value or prices of labor power. Thereby, the whole bourgeois conception of wages hitherto, as well as the criticism hitherto directed against this conception, was thrown overboard once and for all. It was made clear that the wage worker has permission to work for his own subsistence, that is, to live, only insofar as he works for a certain time gratis for the capitalist, and hence also for the latter's co-consumers of surplus value. That the whole capitalist system of production turns on increase of this gratis labor by extending the working day, or by developing the productivity that is increasing the intensity or labor power, etc., that consequently the system of wage labor is a system of slavery, and indeed a slavery which becomes more severe in proportion as the social productive forces of labor develop, whether the worker receives better or worse payment. After all this understanding has gained more and more ground in our party, some return to LaSalle's dogma, although they must have known that LaSalle did not know what wages were, but following in the wake of the bourgeois economists, took the appearance for the essence of the matter. Marx said that they would find new measures to increase profits, either by increasing the workday or by investing in new machinery. In reality, these both happened as well as the exporting of jobs to the third world where the rate of exploitation is higher, lower wages. In places like these, Foxconn for example, the workday can be as long as 14 hours a day as Marx predicted. Flynn is implying Marx used LaSalle's idea of the iron law of wages. Often this is used as a straw man against Marx by libertarians, even claiming that it is Marx's own theory. What Marx really said was that the gap between the wages worker would get paid and what profits would be generated would increase. He is describing a higher rate of exploitation, not a lowering of wages. Lowering of wages can happen, but not necessarily. This was aptly demonstrated in the previous chart showing this increase in inequality. 
Thirdly, our people have allowed themselves to be saddled with the Lasallian Iron Law of Wages, which is based on a completely outmoded economic view. Namely, that an average of the workers receive only the minimum wage because according to Malthusian theory of population, there are always too many workers, such was LaSalle's reasoning. Now, in Capital, Marx has aptly demonstrated that the laws governing wages are very complex, that according to circumstances, now this law, now that, holds sway. That they are therefore by no means iron, but are on the contrary exceedingly elastic and that the subject really cannot be dismissed in a few words, as LaSalle imagined. Malthus' argument, upon which the law LaSalle derived from, his, from him and Ricardo, whom he misinterpreted, is based as that argument appears, for instance, on page 5 of the book, where it is quoted from another pamphlet of LaSalle is extensively refuted by Marx in the section on accumulation of capital. Thus, by adopting the LaSallean iron law, one commits oneself to a false proposition and false reasoning in support of the same. What he is really saying is that he rejects LaSalle's concept of the iron law of wages. He is saying that he believes in Ricardo's concept and that LaSalle didn't understand it. Engels clearly says this as an incorrect conception of the iron law of wages and must be abolished. Dr. Flynn claimed that wages rise in accordance with technological innovation. They did not rise as they decrease slightly as the graph shows. There is no correlation between increased productivity, increased pro productivity is based on technological innovation, and an increase in wages. This can be aptly demonstrated with the graph shown earlier that show a comparison of minimum wage in comparison to an increase in productivity, technological innovation. In part of claiming that workers' wages rise over time, he backs this up with the claim that capitalists compete with each other for the labor of workers because there is a limited supply of it. As a result of the labor market functioning just like any other market, the demand for labor would increase the cost of purchasing it. Except that this is never the case. It implies that the demand for labor exceeds the supply of labor. This has never been the case. There is no time when the general amount of laborers has been less than the demand for it. There are rare cases in which a particular highly skilled labor experiences this shortage phenomenon, but not in the whole of the labor market as Dr. Flynn is claiming. This can easily be demonstrated by the fact that there is never a lack of of unemployment. The unemployment rate never reaches zero, not even socialist countries like the Soviet Union, North Korea, and Cuba, which have exceedingly small unemployment rates, and they were still not able to achieve it. The unemployment rate in Cuba in 2011 was 1.4 percent. This can be demonstrated even further when comparing the number of unemployed people to the number of positions available in the workforce. This statement by Dr. Flynn is completely untrue and is far below what can be expected by a person with a PhD. Finally, he concludes with the claim that monopolies cannot happen because the state would intervene and prevent, prevent it from happening because the state has an interest in doing so. In reality, we can see that this is not always the case. This doesn't negate the fact that individual politicians have their own personal interests and also implies that politicians can't be bought off, which is ridiculous considering the entire political system is funded by the capitalist class, in particular the largest ones, finance capital and the largest physical industry. It's true that the day-to-day -day functions of the government and the elections are paid for by the public. But the hundreds of millions that are spent by politicians running for office are funded almost exclusively by the finance capitalist class. Then, large enterprises, the most elite of the elite. By doing this, we can see the control, the great control they wield over the government, as was witnessed by the bank bailouts following the global collapse of capitalism in 2008. This can also be proven by showing who are the greatest contributors to both the Democrat and Republican campaigns. Along with this, it appears that Dr. Flynn was implying that Marx had never taken state intervention into account with his economic theory. I'm not positive that's what he is saying. It's pretty vague, and he may not be saying it at all. However, considering the intention of this whole section was to discredit Marx, I think it's safe to assume that he was implying it. This is incorrect, however. He did write about it in the third volume of Capital. 
This is the abolition of the capitalist mode of production within the capitalist mode of production itself, and hence a self-dissolving contradiction, which prima facie represents a mere phase of transition to a new form of production. It manifests itself as such a contradiction in its effects. It establishes a monopoly in certain spheres and thereby requires state interference. It reproduces a new financial aristocracy, a new variety of parasites in the shape of promoters, speculators, and simply nominal directors, a whole system of swindling and cheating by means of corporate, corporation promotion, stock issuance, and stock speculation. It is private production without the control of private property. In addition to this, he also had planned to do it in one of the other books that would make up his view on economics. There were six books originally planned, but he died before he even finished the first one, On Capital. Here is a portion of his letter to LaSalle where he declares his intention to do so. Chronologically, this introduction was followed by a letter Marx wrote to LaSalle on February 22, 1858, where he writes, The whole is divided into six books. On Capital contains a few introdu introductory chapters, on landed property, on wage labor, on the state, international trade, world market, generally speaking, the critique and history of political economy and socialism would form the subject of another book, and finally, the short historical outline of the development of economic categories and relations, yet a third. With this, I think I've aptly demonstrated two things. Firstly, either Dr. Flynn doesn't know what he's talking about when it comes to Marxist economic writings, or he's a liar when it comes to Marxist economic writings. Although I find it quite plausible that he was, that he was just merely lied as a function of his position as a bourgeois economist, their job is to quite literally assault any challenges to the standing economic order. It's a pity I never come across a legitimate argument against Marx. I think this demonstrates the inherent intellectual weakness of bourgeois economics. An inability to prove superiority through rational debate, lies and straw men must always be used against Marx. It always proves one thing, an appeal to authority is a true fallacy. This man has a PhD in economics and still didn't understand Marxist economics, or even some basic labor supply and demand concepts. Or perhaps it just took a Marxist to take an honest look at Marxism. Dr. Flynn, I hope for a response.